Okay. Um, fearless. One more time. There is a God. My name is Heather Kidd. Um, I'm actually Ryan Young's littlest sister, and definitely his favorite. Um, it's official, so I'm allowed to say. Uh, he has a lot. Of, he has six sisters, but I, I'm the baby. We've always been friends, um, and uh, so I, when thinking about giving this talk uh, this weekend, I always get a little bit nervous. Uh, I'm not really a public speaker. My um, I'm actually a nurse uh, by profession, and I'm married. Uh, you'll see my husband wandering around with four little ducklings following him. Those are my children. So I was a little nervous. I showed up last night. I saw little father Matt Breslin, and you, you're probably thinking to yourself, little? And yes, little father Matt Breslin, because when I first met uh, father Matt, he was little. He was 12 years old, I think. And he was one of our first campers, and I've only given this talk probably about a handful of times, but that was one of my first talks. And little Matt was there, and I all of a sudden came to peace last night, because I said to myself, you know what? You know, I didn't know what I was doing then. I still don't know what I'm doing now, but God is in charge, and God is the only person that's going to change any minds or hearts. And it doesn't really matter what I say or what I don't say. I've seen God work little Father Matt Breslin from a quiet, little, shy 12-year-old to this priest bigger than life who is funny and exciting and um, just amazing. So God can turn water into wine, as we've all seen. <laughs> Good tasting wine, if I say so. Um, and uh, so it's just amazing what he can do. Um, so then I was thinking, I said, who am I going to speak after this weekend? I said, I sure as heck don't want to go after Father Matt. Like, I'm not that funny. And then I said, I don't really want to go after Father, uh, Brother Elijah. I'm definitely not holy enough to go after him. <laughs> and then I was like, well, I guess I'll go after breakfast. I could probably compete with like some toast and some juice, but little did I know how good the breakfasts were here. So here we are, but there's nothing like talking about chastity at 9.45 on a Sunday morning. Um, so, so yeah, here it goes. Uh, who knows what the word chastity is? If you, like, give me a raise of hands if you know what it is. All right, I'm just trying to feel out my crowd. Okay, so chastity is basically keeping sex within the framework and the bonds of marriage and everything in relation to sex and sexual relations and things like that. So basically keeping these things, these beautiful things that God has given us, but in the framework that he has designed and created for us. And what is that framework? Um, so... All way back when, there was Adam and Eve, and uh, he created them man and woman. God created us man and woman. And he gave us specific bodies and beautiful bodies to basically ha you know, have in relation to a sacrament of marriage between a man and a woman. And this bond that can be created in marriage is so powerful and profound that, and this is not my, I took this from somebody, but... Uh, that within nine months it has to be given its own name sometimes, you know, right? You know what I'm talking about? Babies, right? Um, so if you, um, in our church, the teaching is that, you know, everything in relation to our sexual appetite has to be within that framework of being open to life and in, the, in a committed relationship between a man and a woman. And I always... Uh, the culture is teaching you the exact opposite these days, as you might know. You can't watch a Super Bowl game without seeing just all sorts of things that you're like, wow, this is where we've come to. Um, but the way God designed it is very clear. And the way you distinguish between what is of God and what is not of God, everything that's in relation to God is uh, life-giving. Everything is generating life. And God designed us all. I, I heard this recently, which I thought was really interesting. He actually designed all of us to be parents in some capacity. Um, so some of us, we will be physical parents in our life. Um, and some of us, he's designed us to be spiritual parents. Um, so as you see some of the brothers uh, here this weekend, they're, they're spiritual parents. They're literally taking and guiding us towards uh, and nurturing us and nurturing our faith towards heaven, which is really the ultimate goal. 
because everything we talk about, like this is this is one of the harder talks because it really requires um, everything about chastity requires discipline and um, you know self control, and, and it, it can be challenging. But you know, as we I'm sure they've covered this weekend so far that this life is very short. You know, at most maybe we live a hundred years. And then you think about how long eternity is, it's, it's forever. So these decisions that we make now are, can really not only affect our life here on earth, but our future you know, with our God in eternity. And so you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, I really don't want to hear this lady talk. I've already done all sorts of things that I'm not really proud of. I've already kind of gone down this path that's maybe not that chaste or that holy. And so I'm already past that. It doesn't really matter from here, you know? And I can tell you that it absolutely does. Like, the reason why I wanted to give this talk is because these decisions that you make literally from this day forward, regardless of what you've ever done prior to this, every decision you make from this day forward will literally change the course of your life. And especially everything, like I said, in relation to sex and relations with other people and relationships. Um, will greatly, like these decisions that you make over the next bunch of years will greatly affect your life in this world and the next. Um, and that's why I thought it was so important that, you know, I was very lucky when I was young. So I got, uh, thank God Ryan actually took it upon himself to kind of direct my life. Uh, <laughs> that's just what he does. Um, so first, first I got the talk. Oh, so let me finish up that last thought. So no matter where you are today, it doesn't really matter. Come, uh, bring yourself back to our Lord, and no matter what you've done in the past, say, you know what, God, today is a new day, and I want to be joined with you, and I want to be committed to you, and I'm going to do what I think is the right thing, because it's going to be, believe me, it will be the best decision you've ever made. So, start from today, and, uh, and so anyway, so, my life, I've, I, uh, I was, uh, I've always been a little boy crazy. Since I was like five years old, I used to make these lists of who I had crushes on, and you know, and it would change from day to day. And and I had a bunch of older siblings that all had boyfriends over the house, and I was just dreaming of, you know, my future life with my husband and everything else. And uh, and I didn't ever have the sex talk with my parents. My my mom. The only sex talk I got was. Don't ever, 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 ever have sex before you're married. That was that was my sex song. I said, okay. Um, so then uh, Ryan said to me one day, he said, what do you want your future life to look like? And I said, uh, well, I want to be married. I think one day maybe I probably want kids, you know, maybe I'll work a little bit. And he said, well, what are you going to do to have that happen? And I said, well, gee, I don't know. And he said, well... I can tell you one thing, he said, if you, the decisions you make now will affect that. And he said, there's different ways that people look at each other. And if you present yourself as someone that is, does not, you know, where all these type of uh, physical things are not that sacred and not that important and are just like an everyday thing, you will just be used and you will be, and it doesn't take you um, like, I know growing up, I grew up in public school, and the message that I was receiving all the time was, oh, you know, if someone wants to sleep with me or wants to be my boyfriend or whatever, they must think I'm beautiful, or they must think I'm wonderful, or they must think I'm worthy of that. And Ryan was like, no, actually, Heather, he's like, you could be the most unattractive person in the entire world. He's like, there will be plenty of people who want to sleep with you. And I know that's very blunt. You've probably never heard that at a camp talk before, but it's true. It, it really reframed my whole thought process. And I'm like, you know what? It's not an accomplishment to try to sleep with someone. And it doesn't make me, it doesn't mean that I'm pretty if, if I'm going to have these relations with somebody. So it really helped me kind of reset what the world has been telling me, which is so untrue. You know, and the same thing with the way I, I would dress. He's like, if you're going to dress like, like as if, you know, like a prostitute, people are going to treat you like you're a prostitute and they will not have respect for you. And so I started to try to take that to mind too because when I started, and it was amazing because when I started to present myself differently, I know that when I went to college, 
all the guys around me, like they would talk about other girls in a certain way, and when I was around, I was like on the same, like they would, they would talk badly oftentimes about other girls, and then when I was around, it was like a whole new level, like I was on their level, they were, they, I was their friend, I was, you know, they respected me. And, um, and that was really amazing. Um, and so uh, thank, thank goodness for Ryan and other people who kind of gave me that confidence that, you know what, it's really not about the physical, and to be honest, it's actually the opposite of the way you've been trained. At least I know if, if you happen to go to public school or watch a regular TV often. Um, so that, that helped kind of change my mindset. Uh, let's say my senior year of high school, I would say I was in one of one of my I would say real relationships. I was I had a boyfriend, and actually in reality we were actually just best friends for two or three years. We really weren't even romantic, and like we didn't even think of each other romantically. And then one day we were like, oh my gosh, like I love you, <laughs> you know, like it was. So we were close friends, um, and all of a sudden I was like, wow, I really care about you. And what was interesting is he was actually of a different faith. This is my high school boyfriend. Um, and I felt like, and meanwhile, I wasn't really in a religious place or a holy, like, I hadn't had a conversion yet. I kind of grew up kind of a guilt and fear Catholic where I was like, I guess I'll go to Mass, like, once an hour a week, like, compared to hell, like, you know. Like, that's, that was my thinking. It wasn't like I wanted to go. It wasn't, you know, I was just like, eh, hour a week, I'll, I'll, I'll place my bets. That's worth it. So, um, so that's kind of where I was at. But meanwhile, I had seen other siblings of mine have great Catholic relationships and really have God as the foundation of their marriages. And so even though I wasn't religious or didn't have faith, I said to myself, you know what? Like, one day if God kind of inspires me with this type of faith or if I have a relationship with God one day, which I, I feel like I might, but who knows? I want to be, um, it's going to be difficult if I'm in a relationship where my spouse has no connection or no desire for anything like that. Um, and one analogy I heard, which was kind of interesting, God, like in your marriage, if you want a successful marriage, God has to kind of be the tabletop. And so if you're trying to build a life, it's almost like building a puzzle on your lap if you don't have God as the tabletop to build it on. So, um, so I, like I said, I was kind of, so I ended up, despite loving this high school boyfriend, before I went to college, I actually, I felt like God was saying, you know what, like, I have bigger plans for you, and I know you love him, but I'm, uh, like, I think you'll be more compatible with someone who has that same faith as you. And I kind of trusted God, and I said, okay, fine. So I broke up with the boyfriend. It was very painful and devastating emotionally. But I trusted God. I said, you know what? So, so I go off to college. I, um, I had a sister tell me, she said, Heather, you can be anyone you want to be when you go to college. Like, and in high school, I was like all scared and intimidated, and I felt bad about myself. And so I was kind of just stuck to my little group of friends. And she's like, you know what? Like, if you're confident, people love that. And so I went to college, and I was like every attractive man I met, I was like, hi, I'm Heather, what's going on? You know, I, was, I was all over making friends, I like met my entire quarter of the campus, like, and I just pretended, I faked it until I made it, you know, I was just like, I'm going to pretend I have confidence even though I don't. So I, um, one of those people I met was my current husband, oh, there he is, hi, um, isn't he cute? Um, so I first met him, I, um, we, we actually had this building, it was like this, uh, where he lived on the third floor over here, and I lived on the third floor over here, and so I came in his entrance thinking that logically you could cross from the third floor over to your third floor, but little did I know that you essentially can't get from one third floor to the other. So I was walking around, and I ran into this kid, and I was like, and then, you know, said hi, oh, I'm lost, I don't know where I am. And he's like, oh, you know, and he explained. So I went back to my dorm and I said to my, my best friend, Elise, to this day, I was like, there's another cute guy in our building. He said, you know, um, but in my mind, he was way out of my league. And, you know, like I said, I've always been a little boy crazy. So he, um, we became friends. We started playing on the same football team. Um, he, uh, uh, we had like a little co-rec on the weekend where we played football. Um, and we were just friends, and uh, one day, uh, 
he was wearing an American Eagle cross. So it's not even a real cross. It was almost like a, a first aid cross. And I was sitting studying, and he kind of wandered by and kind of decided to sit down. And um, for some reason, I have no idea why, within like three minutes of the conversation, I told him like the 10 reasons why I'm not gonna have sex before I'm married. <laughs> so I know that's probably not typical, but uh, that definitely, I think, set me apart from a lot of other girls he had been meeting. And as he, and I can tell you, there were, I had a, he, we kind of had a similar group of friends, and these other girls were far more beautiful and funny and great, but I can tell you what set me apart from those other girls because there were very few people who were willing to be like, you know what, I am, I'm 18 years old and I'm, I'm going to wait for my spouse. That's who I'm um, really looking for. And like I said, if you've already been there, there's still a lot of years before you're going to get married and you can make a decision today to make that something you're going to give your spouse as a gift. Um, so anyway, so... I'm sure he walked away from that conversation and was like, whoa, that girl, she's, she's a little different. But I think that really, honestly, was one of the things that probably attracted me to him. And, and even as a guy, I think it was kind of like, wow, she's actually kind of a challenge like compared to these other girls. And thankfully, um, I have to thank video games, because his freshman year in college, my husband had no idea how attractive he was. And he just sat and played video games all day long. And, uh, and thank God for that, because by the time I showed up, like in his sophomore year, we're out at the bars, and now we're at some point dating, and like every girl from across the bar is like, Mike, and they're running across the bar, and I'm like, like, do you not see me standing here? Like, come on. So, um, but either way, uh, it was beautiful because we had this chaste relationship, um, and we dated for five years before getting engaged. And, and another cool little thing, so, so one of the first times we were hanging out, um, so two of our friends kind of wanted to set us up to a degree, so they brought us to Walmart, very romantic, right? Um, and like it was very awkward, because like, we're what, they, they just kind of deserted us, so me and Mike, like we had almost never, like this is when we very first met. We're walking around Walmart, and we're like, huh. And I'm like, okay, get some diapers for the kids, honey. Like, and we're kind of joking around. Then we get to the front of the store, and my friends are like, do you guys realize if you guys got married, Heather, your last name is Young, and his last name is Kid? You could be Heather Young Kid. And I was like, wow, you know, and then five years later, here we are. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, so, so that even had a little joke there for us. Believe me, the, the priest at our wedding had a field day with that one. Um, so anyway, so five years later we're dating, and, and I remember during that even, like I went to Medjugorje at some point, yeah. and yeah, and that, that's a whole other awesome talk, that, changed, uh, that, that is when my major conversion happened, and that's when I fell in love with our Lord, and that's when all of a sudden I wanted to be doing this stuff, it wasn't guilt and fear, it's like I can't wait to be with our Lord, I can't wait to be in adoration, I can't wait to go to Mass, um, and so... Uh, with those, um, so I remember at one point during those five years, I, in Medjugorje, I'm, I'm going to the confession, and one thing I can say was instrumental to that conversion was having a confession where I told him everything for my entire life, like from when I was little, everything I could remember. It was, it was quite a long one. Um, and I remember being like, I don't understand why God's punishing me. Like, I have this boyfriend, I love him, we're very serious, we want to get married, I know we're going to get married. Like, why can't we just do all these things? Like, why is God making life so difficult? Like, we're still in college, like, we're not going to get married as sophomores in college. Like, why is God punishing me? And he said to me, he said, Heather, he's like, what do you want your future life to look like? Like, if, if you and your husband and your boyfriend don't have any self-discipline now, how do you think that's going to magically happen when you're married? Do you think that like you're going to sleep together now and, and then like you get married? And my husband says this all the time. It's like it's not like God just hits you with a wand and says, okay, now you're not attracted to beautiful women. Like the, he's like, if you, he's like, if, do you want to worry that when you're married, every time your husband goes on a business trip and he's away for two weeks that it's, you know, too long and he has to go find somebody else to, because he has no practice in self-discipline? And that really is the reality of it, is that chastity, no matter what your state in life, is a lifelong thing. It's not like, okay, I just 
need to get to the point where we're married and then it's just a free-for-all and everything's easy and there's no need for self-discipline in every respect of life like because the church teaches that even in marriage we want to be open to life you know and obviously there then you need to have like the church teaches natural family planning which is if you if let's say you're on whatever kid it is your eighth kid and you're like wow like that's a lot of kids at this point we can't necessarily hand, handle anymore you know you can uh, not change anything about the marital act and yet you can restrain yourself from most likely dates that you're going to conceive so that you don't end up getting pregnant um, there's, you're always open to life there's chances that you could get pregnant during those times but there's much less likely chance of getting pregnant during those times and so even within the church there's some there's a framework for living a life which um, God is directing and you're always open to life um, and so uh, there's really never a point where it's just like oh it's, and, and even just in regular life it's not like I said me and my husband we were around people all the time and there's plenty of temptation that crosses I'm sure both of our minds and yet because of that committed chaste relationship that we had and because of that friendship that we formed like we have a relationship like no other because there's trust and there's commitment and there's also um, friendship because part of it too when you're dating like and you're dating other uh, if you are dating any other people um, it can be like everything's like happening so fast and and once you fall into the physical realm like all of that emotional and mental interaction kind of dies like like not completely but you cut off really getting to know that person the same thing with the way you dress like I, I heard one time like the the woman who wears very little it's actually showing too little of herself because rather than the man actually getting to know her and know who she is and what she is he stops right at oh wow those are body parts you know and so it there's really um, you want to give yourself the framework for the best possible relationship um, and so that's another thing I kind of ask myself I'm like well why is he punishing us and why does he have it set up like this with all these like why does God have this set up in all these ways and what it all boils down to is that it's the greatest likelihood that the family will exist which is a mother and a father to raise a child and so all this whole Catholic framework is all based on the promotion of a family and having a child grow up with both a mother and a father and that doesn't always happen as we all know and there can be a lot of hurt when that doesn't happen and um, but there is something there women and men are different and even though you're being told things all the time that they're the same and they're interchangeable and you can pick what you want and everything else there is actually a difference between men and women and there's beautiful differences and while they are completely equal in dignity they are not the same and so to opt, to act like they're interchangeable or or doesn't matter is really not a not from god and that's not true and so this entire catholic framework that we go with is based on giving every child the chance to have both a mother, the greatest likelihood of a committed relationship and a mother and father to raise them and the other thing is that discipline um, that me and Mike developed over those years like I always honestly that's one of the few sacrifices you can make at your age in relationships with your let's say future spouse you know um, like everything else in a relationship is like let's go to the movies and it's like oh I, I don't go to the movies like that's not hard for me or you know let me you know everything is kind of self-serving in these relationships prior to getting married except for I would say chastity chastity is really like I want this but I'm not gonna take it because it's not mine and I can tell you that that is such a well that was like the biggest struggle and crutch for us throughout all of our dating years I look back and I'm like now like since then we had at one point we had three children under the age of two like we had a one and then we had twins and like those are the craziest years of our life like my husband was always like I have no idea what happened in those three years like he's like we would wake up we would work 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 like at 11 o'clock at night we both sit down on the couch 
and for 15 minutes we would try to stay awake and like pretend like we knew each other and then <laughs> and then we would start all over again the next day and it was just like so much screaming and so much crying we had no air conditioning at the time so like it was it was really our, our windows are always open and I'm sure the neighbors were always like what is happening in that house the babies are always screaming we were screaming it was just a lot of screaming <laughs> but it was rough and I and I can say that if I had a weak-hearted person who hadn't already made so many sacrifices and commitments to me and if we didn't have the friendship that we had to start out with we would have never lasted through that and even just the simple things like who like waking up in the middle of the night like if different things happen like because of those bonds that we formed that's why we have the relationship we have today and when the going gets tough we both are willing to make any sacrifices necessary to make it happen and work um, and and that's really what I think God designed in the, in the first place with all of this have any of you guys seen the giver or read the book yeah. oh that's a good number I like it I like it okay so at least half um, so I recently uh, I feel like it was the Holy Spirit I went on our family went on a little vacation for the first time in like four years and I came across my fourth grade copy of The Giver. It literally was like mangled and like, it, it looked like the Bible, it was awesome. The cover of the pages were all brown and like falling off, like paper, th like really thin. And, but I was like, I'm gonna read this to my kids. So I loved the book when I was in fourth grade. I read it to my kids over vacation. And then it just hit me one morning. I said, wow, this book really communicates a lot. So for all of you who haven't read it, the book is, basically this dystopic world where there are they the government kind of takes away color and pain and weather changes and nobody's better than anybody else everyone kind of gets assigned their job that they think they're kind of the the government says oh well you'd be a good nurturer you're going to go work with all the babies and you're going to be good at you know being working in the kitchen and so you kind of give everyone their jobs and no one's really allowed to shine and nobody and that's the way the world is that's what everyone in the book everyone in the book is well-meaning they're kind they're loving people but there's not really allowed to be loved like there's very controlled on what feelings can exist and it's really a world without god like there's no there's not allowed to be love even when people like at one point the kid says to the dad like do you love me and the dad kind of looks at him and is like i think you want to use a different word there like the, so there's not really, and they kind of get assigned to their family. So it's this very controlled world where the people in it are trying to control it and change it. And it's very devoid of anything God-given. And so the, the main character of the book, he turns of whatever age, and he's going to receive all the memories from the old man who knew what the world used to be like, where there was color and pain and happiness and joy and children and everything else and so he receives all this all these memories of what the world used to be like and he's like oh my gosh like everyone's missing out you know and what he also realizes is that in this in the original colorless world there were all these things that they did it was like we release the babies that aren't that healthy we just um we we release them which in the kids mind at the time growing up in this world oh they wrap them in a blanket and they must like put them they give them to this other world and he must like He's very comfortable and he lives in this other world where they release people and they also took all the old people and they said oh like when you become old enough and you're not really helpful to society we release you too so the boy's like oh this is great like i can't wait for you 75 year old you're gonna go be released and live this other wonderful life and when he ends up becoming the receiver of all the memories he realizes that they're actually just euthanizing everyone they're killing the babies like he watches and he he doesn't he also realizes that his own dad is who's the nurturer who's releasing all these babies is actually really literally killing the baby and then throwing them in a trash bin and and so he's all of a sudden sees reality for what it is and it's like this mind-blowing thing of like wow this is what we're really doing even though everyone's walking around like oh we live in this perfect place but in reality they're killing their um you know there's no God and so it kind of struck me because I was like I've been trying to figure out how to explain all these things to my kids and my kids are so young and yet in our world today you can't do anything without being taught all these things that really aren't of God anymore like these things that just aren't reality 
And so I was like, how do I explain this to my kids? But Because I don't want them walking around saying, oh, you know, I don't want them also to think negatively of these people. Like, let's say somebody has, um, is a, uh, confused about their gender. I don't want my kids to say, oh, well, that's a bad person, or they're not good. I want them to understand, no, this is a well-meaning person who God loves and we love, but they're confused and they don't necessarily realize that God doesn't make mistakes. Like, God made them a man or a woman, and just because they might like traits of the other kind, or let's say they're like a little confused, doesn't mean they're a bad person. And that's what I really enjoyed about the book, because all these people walking around in this colorless world were good meaning people with good intentions, and they knew nothing else. And what I'm seeing in our world today is such a, there's such a barrage of things changing so quickly, where 50% of the people are trying to change things to the fact, to the point where our children will grow up, and, and in school, they won't know, I'm a he, I'm a she, I'm a this, I'm a that, I, I'm a multiple people, I, um, same-sex attraction, this is very normal, but like being told that, oh yeah, like 50% of the population has same-sex attraction, and all these different things that are not reality. But if you grow up from a such a young age in this colorless world, you don't know any better. You don't know what the world was like when family and God existed, and when abortion was not a everyday thing and like brushing your teeth you know when you grow up in this world where it's just completely upside down you don't know any better and that's what they're trying to achieve like I never used to get that care that much um, about what other people were doing I'm like you know what like I, I wish they knew what God's plan was for them but it doesn't you know necessarily affect me at this point it affects me my children can't go to public school without being brainwashed that they can choose whatever they want to be on any given day. And for me, that's hard because I know what God's plan is for them and I know God's beauty and love and everything that he wants to create and the lives that he wants to fill. And that's going to get lost very quickly if we don't stand up and start paying attention and at least being aware of the difference between good, right and wrong and good and evil and truth and non-truth. So um, that's what I've been thinking. And the giver, like I said, I, I, these people in the, in the book and in, in, in our world today, everybody who's trying to teach you these things, they're not bad people. And I tell my kids all the time, like, like, so let's say there is a boy in your class who has same-sex attraction. Are you friends with him? Like, should you be friends with him? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Should you hang out with him? People who um, have these different struggles, they're not alone. Every person, by the way, I don't think there's a person in this room who has gone through puberty who hasn't had sexual struggle, whether they've succumbed to different temptations or not. Every single one of us is struggling with different attractions and things that are not necessarily what God has designed for us. But that's where chastity comes in, where we actually, we don't act like animals. We make conscious decisions over what God wants for us and what his will is for us. Um, and so uh, I, uh, and, and if you notice, I use the word same-sex attraction because our world wants you to make your identity, like they want to say, I'm gay, you know. That's not your identity. Your identity is a so uh, son and daughter of God. That, that's your primary identity. You are an heir to the kingdom of heaven. And we are not identified by our different attractions and everything else. Like that is not your primary identity. And so that's where I would always speak to, you know, like I said, and, and, and people with these different thoughts are, like I said, they're no different. I have plenty of thoughts that I know are not of God um, that cross my mind on a regular basis. And I'm like, you know what? Like I might want to do that, but that's not really what God wants for me, you know? So um, that all being said, uh, I, uh, the other thing is our world really wants to preach the word tolerance. And really what that word comes from is tolerate. And I have to say, as Catholics, we don't just tolerate people who are different than us. We actually love people who are different than us. We don't just say, oh, I guess, I guess you'll be OK. No, we love them. We draw them in. We are friends with them. We draw them to Christ and we give them everything that we can. And I know that, in general, I, um, 
I personally, like, I feel like I, I'm quite a bit older than you, uh, but I'm, I'm very oftentimes the same way I was as a teenager, which is I'm starving for attention. I'm starving for um, uh, acceptance. I'm starving for likes. I'm starving for love. And I think we're all starving for that to a degree. And there is only one way to satisfy that that need, and it's really through Christ. That's that is the only person that can satisfy that desire. So when you find yourself starving, come and get fed. Come to the altar. Come to mass. Come and meet our Lord in the Eucharist. Receive Him, and feel satisfied. And when you need attention, pray. Pray and let God give you that attention that you seek, because. If you were the only person in this world, uh, I heard this once and it really actually touched me. If you were the only person that was alive and, and Jesus had to decide whether he was going to die on that cross just for you, he would do it. Just you. Not for everybody. He would make a decision just for you and just for you and just for you. And every person here, he would make the decision all over again to die on a cross if he needed to because that's how much he loves you. You are loved, and don't forget that, and don't let anyone tell you anything differently. You are loved. Hello, this is Grandpa Bob Young. If you like this video, click on the subscribe button, and then ring the bell and specify all. That way we will be able to notify you as new videos become available. Thank you.